This is going to be part two of the overview of the book of James. And we're in chapter three now. Chapter three, you're going to see about how the tongue is a fire that cannot be tamed. James 3, 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. You see, your tongue can do more damage to someone than any weapon on this earth. It can do more damage than a wildfire to their life. And with the tongue, a woman can persuade a man to kill you. With the tongue, a man can command an army to kill thousands of innocent people. With the tongue, you can ruin someone's testimony, their marriage, their friendships, their reputation, and everything they have. You can cause a huge fight that will last years. It says in James 3, 7 and 3, 8, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Your tongue is more dangerous than a serpent. Some of these people are out there training snakes to where, you know, the snake can dance with them and everything else. You can tame a snake. You can tame animals, all kinds of wild animals. But nobody can tame the tongue of a gossiping woman. It's full of deadly poison. And that's more scary than a serpent. You just don't realize it. James 3.14, But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. People's heart is full of envy. The envy comes out on their tongue. Uh, they can't be happy for anybody. They are bitter because they don't have the ministry someone has, the life someone has, the car someone has, the the wife, the husband someone has. They're bitter because they don't have what you have. And so it makes them want to use their tongue against you. Maybe try to hurt your reputation. And it says in James 3.15, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. The tongue is kind of a scary, creepy thing at times because sometimes you're letting something else be in control of your tongue. And all these things are earthly, sensual, devilish. There's devils behind your tongue. They're influenced. The things you say when you are get full of bitter, bitterness and envy and strife, it's influenced by devils. And when you can't be happy for somebody and you're always trying to keep something going, keep drama going, sow discord between people, always starting fights and drama, you're led by the devil. It says in James 3.16, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But then notice this contrast. But the wisdom that is from above... It's first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. You don't need to walk around like all these guys that are full of bitterness and envy. They're always in a bad mood. They're always mad because they ain't got what you got. They aren't peaceable in the slightest. They aren't gentle. They aren't easy to be entreated, meaning you can't talk to them or ask them a question without them smarting off, looking at you like you're stupid or getting mad, and the devil gets a hold of their tongue and makes them say things that they shouldn't say. But your tongue is a fire. It's full of deadly poison. You know, let your words be few. You don't want a multitude of words always coming out of your mouth. Chapter 4. Life is like a vapor, so humble yourself, resist the devil and the lusts of men. That's a summary of this chapter. It says in James 4.1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? You see, war isn't wrong. God was behind many righteous wars. But there are men who start wars because they're lusting after stuff that somebody else has, and they lust for more power. And that's uh, it's unrighteous war. It says in James 4, 2 through 4, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, 
yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that, that you may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whatsoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You don't want to be a friend of the world. In John fifteen nineteen, the Lord said, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. It says in 1 John two fifteen, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It says in Galatians 1, 4, talking about Jesus who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. John 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. This world is an evil place. The world's not your home. You're just passing through. And the more you start loving it down here, the less you're going to long for it up there. So don't be a friend of the world. James 4.13 says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Watch out about um, saying you're going to do such and such tomorrow or a year from now because you don't know what's coming in your life. Proverbs 27 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And the tribulation saint also really needs to watch it. You see, a man could be living his life after the rapture. The mark gets implemented sometime during that time, and then he has to sell out to the Antichrist just to go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. So watch out before you say that kind of stuff because Revelation thirteen seventeen and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And remember, James, primarily doctrine for those in the tribulation, they need to watch out before they start saying what somebody said in James four thirteen. Today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. They're not going to know in the tribulation what's coming from one day to the next. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Your like is like a spray from a Febreze can in light of eternity. It's so short and people think it's going to last forever. You see, those people who go through the tribulation will be shocked at what happens from one day to the next. Imagine if you could read the newspaper a day in advance during the tribulation. You wouldn't be able to go to sleep at night. You'd go crazy. Now, chapter 5. A quick summary for chapter 5. While wicked men oppress, be patient for the Lord's coming and the early and latter rain. James 5.1. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Notice again the negative talk towards the rich man. In the story of the rich man Lazarus, the rich man is the one who went to hell. In the tribulation, the rich men will be those who are openly against God, openly perverts, openly evil. And if you're good, they're going to hate you. James 5.2 your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. They will think they have the world by the tail, but they will find out this world is temporary pleasure. And that's why it says in Matthew six nineteen through 20, Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. They're going to find out that these treasures down here are, are nothing. James 5, 3, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Not only have they stored up money and material items, but they've treasured up wrath. You see, there is a cup, and the more they sin, the fuller the cup of God's wrath is going to get. It says in Romans 2, 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up 
unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. They're just treasuring up wrath. It says in James 5, 4, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sebaoth. You see, the rich men get rich by fraud. They get riches dishonestly and through evil means. It's, it says in James 5, 5, Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. And 1 Timothy 5, 6 says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You see, you're living in a world that is led by dead men, entertained by dead men, and influenced by dead men. Have you ever just stopped and looked at how everything is so fake? And this is one of the reasons why I love the Bible and Bible believers, because in a world of fakers, we need some real people that believe something that is real. That's a Bible believer. You know, how is this world fake? Well, look at the politicians. They're completely fake. They're liars and fake everything. I mean, look at the celebrities. It's all fake happiness, a fake dream world that they live in. The shows that are supposed to be reality shows are also very fake. Even if they use real people and real names, they have to add 90% fakeness just to entertain people because people love fakers. The whole LGBT movement is fake. They plaster these trannies all over everything that you see now. And it's just all so fake. Trannies aren't being real. They're not real at all. They're not being real with people. They're trying to be something else. If you have to put all that makeup on and a wig and a horse clothes and nails and eyelashes and change your walk and your talk and all that stuff, you know what? That's not real. It's fake. It, it's a movement based on fakeness and perversion. No, no uh, I don't want to see nobody's fakeness. I don't want to see a bunch of perverts dancing around like some hoe. That's just nasty. But these sodomites go walking and talking and acting like a woman when they're not a woman. It's fake. It's not real. Men do not naturally talk and walk and act that way. All everyone wants... They want to use these fake Bibles as well that change the words. They add words, subtract words, take out all the power. They got fake worship music that says the same thing, every line. And you could, I mean, the songs are so, like, vague. You could dedicate this, this song to your husband for Valentine's Day because it sounds like they're singing to their Valentine, not the God of heaven and earth. It's fake. It's all fake. Everything is also fake. James 5, 6. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. That's exactly what they'll be doing in the trib. Condemning and killing the just. In Revelation 20 and verse 4, it talks about the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They're going to be condemning and killing the just in the trib at an all-time high. And of course they do that now. But in Revelation 6, 9, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altars the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. In Revelation 16, 6, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Revelation 18, 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. You see, killing just people will be at an all-time high. They're going to kill and condemn the just. But James 5, 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. And hath long patience for it until the, he receive the early and latter rain. And notice that phrase, be patient. You see, the tribulation saints are going to have to be patient. Luke 21, 16 through 19. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall say they shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience, 
possess ye your souls. James 5, 8 says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Notice it says, The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It's putting you in the context of that time period of the second coming. And they're going to have to be patient. Because if they get impatient, and they say, Hey, I want to go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. They go right down to the mark of the beast place and they get the mark of the beast and they do their worship of the beast and then they're doomed. They ran out of patience and now they're in for it. J James 5, 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. You see, they're going to have to stick together. Don't grudge one against another. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. They're going to have to stick together. There's not going to be very many in light of all the other, uh, other people in the world who have bowed down to the Antichrist. James 5, 11 through 12, Behold, we count them happy which, notice this word, we count them happy which endure. And notice this other word, ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy. But of all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. Notice that, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Remember in Hebrews, if they shall fall away, it was going to be impossible to renew them again into repentance. This certain fall is a fall that you can't fall. Because you are born again. You're sealed into the day of redemption. You're eternally secure. You're spiritually circumcised. Not so for the trib saints. Those trib saints better not swear by the Antichrist. If they do, they'll fall into condemnation. They will fall away. Hebrews 6 talks about it. Second Thessalonians 2 talks about a falling away. And I believe that that falling away is a falling away that happens in the tribulation and not at the end of the church age. Even though I do believe in the, in the last days of the church age, it will it's a, a, be apostasy and that we're in that now I believe but I believe the falling away in 2 Thessalonians 2 is a falling away that happens in the tribulation James five seventeen and 18 Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit over and over again it keeps going to that time period. You see, Elias is Elijah. And it says in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You see, Elijah is going back, is going to come back as one of those two witnesses in the tribulation. And he will cause it to quit raining again. Notice the context over and over puts you in the context of the tribulation, the second coming of the Lord. Showing you plain as day that James is primarily doctrine for the tribulation time period. It's written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. In Revelation eleven six, it shows you Elijah as one of the two witnesses. It doesn't say his name there, but you know, you can put two and two together. You can make the connection. It says, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Two witnesses, most likely Moses and Elijah. Elijah is going to cause it to stop raining yet again in that future tribulation time period. And it's just crazy that it brings him up here in James chapter 5. And over and over again, putting you in that context of the, the end, the tribulation time period. But... This is the end of the book of James, and we'll continue with First Peter next time.